This video contains tedium and puppies, lots of puppies, but even that won't get you through the tedium. However, there's nothing threat inducing unless you don't like puppies or statistics. Hi, and today we are going to look at contrast coding. So this lecture is basically a follow up to the previous lecture. In the previous lecture, we looked at dummy or indicator coding as a way of entering categorical predictors into a linear model. And today, we're gonna to move that on to look at a different type of coding scheme known as contrast coding. So we've uh, talked in pretty much every previous lecture about this process of fitting models and answering scientific questions. So we start off with a question, we sample some data using some kind of uh, research design that addresses the question that we're interested in addressing. We'll visualize those data, so have a look at what it looks like before we do anything. Then we fit some kind of model, and that statistical model should represent the hypotheses that we were originally interested in testing. We've seen that when we fit a model, we do a number of things. So we can estimate parameters. So in other words, kind of just estimate the effects that we've measured. And we can do that with either a single value known as a point estimate or a confidence interval or an interval estimate we can hypothesis test those parameters so we can see whether those parameters are different from a particular value, which normally the value is zero. We've also seen that the models we fit will have various assumptions and various things that can bias them and that we need to look at those things and when uh, our models have not met the assumptions or when they look like there are sources of bias, then we would fit robust versions of those models instead. So today we're still just focusing on changing the kind of form of the model or looking at how the model adapts to different kinds of predictors. In the previous lecture, we looked at entering categorical predictors into the model and we're gonna continue on that theme today. So by the end of this session, hopefully, uh, we're gonna spend most of the time having a look at what planned contrasts or planned comparisons are and how we code these. So how we use different kinds of coding schemes to dummy coding to make different comparisons between groups when we're using categorical predictors. We will have a look very briefly at a kind of different approach to this uh, problem of comparing groups, uh, which is known as post hoc tests. We'll have a look again very, very briefly at how you can look at trends in means, which are known as polynomial contrasts. However, for the bulk of today, we are going to look at something called contrast coding. Now, we've seen before that the F statistic is used to measure the overall fit of a model. So it's a general test of model fit. And when we have categorical predictors, what this means is that the F statistic is a general measure of whether uh, the outcome can be predicted from group means. So we can use the F test as a kind of overall test of whether a categorical predictor significantly predicts an outcome or significantly improves the fit of a model. We've also seen that to get more specific information about which groups in particular are contributing to predicting the outcome, we can look at the model parameters themselves. We can look at the betas in the model and possibly their significance tests to tell us which groups, which group means in particular differ. And we've also seen that one way to achieve this is to use dummy coding. So when we use dummy or indicator coding, two names for the same thing, what we're effectively doing is comparing each category, each group mean to a baseline group mean. So we basically choose one of our groups to be a baseline against which we compare all our other groups. However, there are going to be times when that's not what we want to do. We don't just want to compare everything to one other group. There might be different ways that we want to kind of uh, break down the differences between means. And uh, today we're going to look at one of the ways that we can do something different. Hello and welcome to Spaniel TV with your host, Milton the Spaniel. Hmm, these lectures are really boring. Hmm, what do they need to spice them up? Hmm, puppies. Yeah, puppies will definitely boost the student evaluations. I'm going to put some puppies in this lecture. 
So let's have a look at a situation where we might want to do something different to dummy coding. Although actually in this particular situation, dummy coding would work quite well. So imagine uh, you're doing a randomized control trial, sometimes called an RCT, of puppy therapy. Now there has been research on pet therapy and you know whether it kind of affects people's well-being. And um, I mean, much as I would love the evidence to be overwhelmingly in favor of puppy therapy having an amazing effect on everyone, um, it turns out the results are somewhat mixed. So you might want to do some, you know, some new research. So what we're going to do is uh, a small randomized control trial of puppy therapy. So does it kind of improve people's uh, well-being to engage in puppy therapy, have some contact with puppies? So we randomize people into three groups. We have a control group where um, they get no puppies. They're a sad, sad, sad group because they have no puppies. All the puppies have gone to the other groups. They've been randomized to the rubbish group that gets no puppies. Some other people get randomized into 15 minutes of puppy therapy. So they get to interact with a cute, fluffy little puppy for 15 minutes. And then another group gets a kind of double dose of puppies. So they get to interact with puppies for 30 minutes. And the outcome is going to be some kind of dodgy psychological measure of happiness. So let's say a self-report scale of happiness from zero, I'm terribly, terribly, terribly unhappy, to 10, I'm extremely happy indeed. So it's a simple little three group experiment and our outcome is happiness. Now what you might predict, assuming that you, know, you think puppy therapy actually works, is that any form of puppy therapy should be better than the control group. So having any dose of puppies should uh, lead to higher happiness scores than having no dose of puppies. You might also feasibly uh, argue for a kind of dose response hypothesis so that the means will just go up. So no puppies will have the lowest mean or the no puppy group will have the lowest mean then 15 minutes the mean, will, mean happiness will go up, 30 minutes will go up even more. So that'll be a sort of dose response. So the more uh, exposure to puppies you have, the happier you are. So these are some predictions that we might make. Let's have a look at some data. Um, just to keep everything sort of manageable for the purpose of a lecture, it's a very, very small study. We've only got five participants per arm. Um, in the real world, you'd want more than that. But anyway, just keep the, the numbers relatively straightforward. And what we can see is in the no puppy condition, mean happiness is 2.2. Remember, it's on a 10 point scale. So that's quite low. People are not very happy in the no puppy control condition. In the 15 minute puppy condition, 3.2 on that 10 point scale. Also pretty low. People in this study, not very happy in general. And for the 30 minute puppy condition, it's five out of 10, which again, it's only halfway along that scale. So, you know, it's not, but I mean, you know, it's not too much happiness overall. If you look overall at the mean across all of the participants, regardless of which group they're in, the mean happiness is 3.467 on that 10 point scale. So like I say, pretty, pretty low. So if we wanted to analyze these data with a general linear model, this is an experimental design. So we've randomized people into three different groups. And we saw in the previous lecture that we can deal with experimental groups using a linear model by using dummy coding. We can input categories of people or groups of people using dummy coding. And what we learned in the previous lecture was that we can uh, adopt a coding scheme where we choose some kind of group as a control. So the obvious control here is the no puppy group. And then we construct what are known as dummy variables, which code group membership using zeros and ones. So what we say is in our reference group, our control group, anyone in that group gets a zero on all the dummy variables. Then we code one of the other groups using a one for one of the dummy variables. So we might say the 15 minute group, we give them a one on the second dummy variable. And we could call that dummy variable short because that is gonna represent the 15 minute group versus the no puppy group. And for the final group, we would code it with a one on the other dummy variable. So in this case, 
on the slide, hopefully you can see the 30 minute group gets a code of one on the first dummy variable and a zero on the second, which means that we could call this first dummy variable long because that represents the long dose of puppy therapy compared to the control. What we also learned in the previous lecture was that by using this kind of coding scheme across those two dummy variables, group membership is kind of completely um, described. So if you're in the no puppy group, you get a zero and a zero. If you're in the 15 minute group, you get zero on the first dummy variable, one on the second. And if you're on in the 30 minute group, you get a one on the first dummy variable and a zero on the second one. So across those two variables, there's a unique, there's unique pairings of codes that describe which group someone belongs to. So in our in the model that we fitted last week, it would look like this. We'd be predicting happiness from B to zero, which is basically going to be uh, happiness in the no puppy group. So happiness when both dummy variables are coded as zero or when all predictors are zero. Then we're going to predict it from the long dummy variable and this will have a beta attached to it and that beta will represent the difference in means between the 30 minute group and the control group, the no puppy group. And we're also going to predict it from the short dummy variable that also has a B attached to it. And that B is going to represent the difference between the mean of the 15 minute group and the no puppy group. And like I said, for this particular experimental design, this makes perfect sense. Like you might want to control, uh, sorry, you might want to compare both your doses to the no puppy control and that will be fine. This plot shows the raw data. So on the left hand side, we've got the five participants in the no puppies group. In the middle section, we've got the five participants who had 15 minutes of puppy therapy. And on the right hand side, we've got five participants who had the 30 minutes of puppy therapy. Now the predicted values for these participants depends on their group membership. So here are the group means, and these are the predicted values of the model. So if you're in the no puppy group, your predicted value is 2.2. If you're in the 15 minute therapy group, then your predicted value is 3.2, the group mean. And if you're in the 30 minute uh, puppy therapy condition, you're very lucky. And also your predicted value is um, <laughs> five which is also the, uh, the group mean. Now the betas attached to the dummy variables represent differences between these group means. So the beta attached to the long dummy variable represents the difference between five and 2.2. So the difference between the mean in the long group and the uh, no puppy control. Whereas the other beta value, the beta value is associated with the short uh, dummy variable represents the difference between the 15 minute therapy group mean and the no puppy group mean. So just to state all of this a bit more explicitly, the model we're fitting, we're predicting happiness from these two dummy variables, the long and the short one. The intercept of the model, the beta zero, is going to be the value of happiness when our two predictors have a have a value of zero. So when long is zero and short is zero, the two dummy variables are zero. And that represents the control group, the no puppy control. So the beta zero is the mean of the no puppy group, which is 2.2. The beta attached to the long dummy variable represents the difference between the group means of the uh, 30 minute group and the control group, which is five minus 2.2 gives us 2.8 and the b attached to the short dummy variable represents the difference between the mean of the 15 minute group and the no puppy group so 3.2 minus 2.2 or 1. so these are the actual values that b will take on so i'm just showing you the differences in the group means so when we have a look at the the output of the model you can map them on you can see like you know just as a reminder of the previous lecture that these values do actually map on the differences between group means so here's the model fitted to the data as we would have done if we followed all the uh, uh, everything that we learned in the previous lecture. So uh, basically we'd get an F statistic of 5.12 uh, with 2 and 12 degrees of freedom, which is significant. The p value of 0.02, which is less than, uh, you know, let's assume we're using 0.05. Uh, so we've got a significant fit of the model. So dose does seem to significantly, or dose of puppy therapy seems to significantly affect happiness. 
we got an R squared of 0.46, so about 46% of the variance in happiness is being accounted for by group membership. So that's the kind of overall effect of group membership or you know dose of puppy therapy. Then our parameter estimates can break this effect down. And the highlighted values here map onto the values that I've just calculated. So the intercept is 2.2, the, the uh, no puppy group mean. Um, <clears throat> and most important, we've got our two dummy variables, one representing the uh, 15 minute group versus the uh, no puppy control, and the second one representing the 30 minute group compared to the no puppy control. And they have premises of one and 2.8, which is what we computed on the previous slide. And we could look at the p-values associated with the test statistics that are derived from those b's. And you'll see that the, uh, the first dummy variable, the one that compares the 15 minute to the control group is not significant, but the one that compares the 30 minute group to the control group is significant. So it looks like 30 minutes of puppy therapy significantly affects your happiness compared to having none, but 15 minutes is not enough to have a significant effect. Just to, uh, you know, also just ram home, we can look at these confidence intervals as well. And if we're prepared to assume that this sample is one of the 95% where the confidence interval is gonna hit the population value under that assumption, which could be wrong, um, we could say that the, the actual sort of population difference in means between the 30 minute group and the control group is gonna be somewhere between about 0.87 and 4.73 you know, at, kind of at the extremes. Um, you can also interpret these raw effects. So in the, in the sort of low dose compared to the control, there's a difference of one. So if you have 15 minutes of puppy therapy compared to none, you'll be one point happier on that 10 point scale. Whereas uh, if you get 30 minutes of puppy therapy compared to none, your shift, your happiness will shift 2.8 points on that scale. A shift of 2.8 is, you know, pretty pretty decent shift on a 10 point scale but it depends on the scale and what those points actually represent okay so like i said you don't always want to make those comparisons though so you can sometimes especially in experimental research you might want to do what are known as planned contrast or planned comparisons like I said though, you don't always want to make those particular comparisons to like a control group. And especially in experimental research, um, there might be different kinds of comparisons that you wanna make. And these are called planned comparisons. So um, what you gotta bear in mind is we've looked before at the model sum of squares. And the model sum of squares, when you do experimental research and when you're looking at a group membership where you randomly assign people to participants, is that that SSM, the model sum of squares, is due to participants being assigned to different groups. So the, that, the variability that, that creates is variability created by an experimental manipulation if you're doing experimental research. So you can break down this variability to test specific hypotheses about which groups might differ. And we break it down in a way according to hypotheses that you make before you run the experiment. So you have a set of hypotheses about what's gonna happen and that determines how we subdivide our model sum of squares. So it's a bit like cutting up a cake. Let's imagine we take our three groups. So we've got our no puppy control group, with sad, miserable looking face. We've got our 15 minute group who has a puppy and then we've got a 30 minute group who's got a double dose of puppies. That group's got all the puppies. Now, if you imagine the model sum of squares, so this is the sum of squares that's attributable to group membership is a bar of chocolate. Now, what we're effectively doing with contrast coding is we're breaking up that bar of chocolate and allocating chunks across the three groups. So in our first contrast, we're kind of uh, singling out the control group and saying to the control group, how many of these chunks can you eat? And the control group might say, well, I can, I can eat one of those chunks of chocolate. So one chunk of the model sum of squares gets given to the control group and it gets eaten. 
And the fact it gets eaten is important because it's gone. It's gone into the stomach. It's not coming back. We're not seeing it again. We're not going to get the control group to regurgitate it because that would be disgusting. It's gone. Never to come back. So that one chunk has been allocated and we can't use it again. And what we've got is four chunks left over. And those four chunks we know are made up of the 15 minute group and the 30 minute group. So in contrast to, we kind of split those four chunks apart. So we say, for example, to the 15 minute group, how many of those chunks do you want? How many can you eat? And it might say, well, I can eat one of those chunks as well. So then the 15 minute group also has a chunk and it eats it. So it's gone, it's in the stomach, it's not coming back, it's not getting regurgitated, it's gone forever. And that means that we know that the remaining three chunks must be attributable to the 30 minute condition. So then the 30 minute condition eats them and is very happy about it too. So really this process of contrast coding is just like breaking up the variance of the model sum of squares. So the, the effect of group membership is breaking it up into its constituent chunks and seeing how much of that variation is attributable to each group. So we've seen before that uh, the variability in outcome scores you can measure using uh, a total sum of squares and you can partition that into two sections, a model sum of squares, which is the improvement due to predicting the outcome from your predictors. And you've got residual sum of squares, which is the error in prediction that you still have even when you put those predictors in the model. But we can slice this model sum of squares up into smaller chunks, which is effectively kind of what we do with dummy coding. The problem with dummy coding is that we reuse some of those slices, like we're always using the control group. So they're not like independent chunks of variability. And this is quite an important thing because if you do, if you dummy code, if you use dummy coding, the um, two predictors that you end up having, the dummy variables are not independent of each other. And what this means is that their significance tests are related to each other because they're using the same control group. So dummy, when you do dummy coding, you are not controlling the type one error rate across your significance tests when you look at the, the parameters. So when you look at significance tests of the betas, you're not controlling the type one error rate. So there are ways to combat that. You can use a stricter criterion for significance, but you know other things being equal, um, you just need to be aware that if you had sort of lots of those comparisons, your type one error rates are going to creep up. A different approach is to choose contrasts that are independent. So the same group never gets bought in to more than one contrast as a sort of independent unit. So one way to choose contrast is just to say, well, if I single out a group in a contrast, then I'm not going to use that in any subsequent contrast. That's going to kind of guarantee that my contrasts are independent and I'm going to control the type one error rate. You only ever want to compare two things at a time because if you're comparing more than two things at a time, you've got that same problem that you have with your overall F ratio or F statistic that you would know there was a difference between means, but you wouldn't know which means were different. If we subdivide, so we're only ever comparing two chunks at a time, two chunks of variation at a time, we know that any difference we get is you know chunk A versus chunk B. There's no ambiguity when we interpret it. We want to end up with K minus one number of contrasts. So K is the number of groups. So if we, in our puppy therapy example, we've got three groups, we want to end up with two contrasts. This is really the same thing that happens with dummy coding. You just end up with, you know, if you, if you do your uh, contrast properly, you end up with one fewer contrast than the number of groups you started off with. So the way to start off is to think about your experimental design. This, in a way, this is a hard thing to teach because there isn't like a set of rules you can follow in all circumstances. This is more about you design your experiment and you design it in a way so that you, you know, when you analyze, you think about your analysis before you uh, actually collect any data. Crazy idea. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's like what you should be doing, right? Um, and you design it in such a way that you can partition your variance sort of sensibly. So generally, if you're doing experimental research, you will have one or more control groups. So your starting point should be really to compare everything to your control group. You know, that's gonna be where, where, you, where you start from. So do the groups where I did something, 
differ from the groups where I did nothing. In our case, do the groups that have any contact with puppies, are they happier than the group that had no contact with puppies? Because the logic of control groups is you would, you know, it's kind of, they have the absence of the thing that you're interested in. In our case, they have an absence of puppies. So you're expecting a group that has an absence of puppies to differ from a group that has a presence of puppies. So your first contrast will normally be comparing any control groups in a chunk with any experimental ones in a separate chunk. That doesn't always make sense, but that's a reasonable place to start. I don't think you noticed the puppies that I put in, and they have improved things, but the lecture's still pretty dull. I think I need to ramp up the puppy content. So in our puppy example, our first hypothesis would be that people that have puppy therapy will be happier, have higher happiness scores than those who don't. In other words, our control, control group should be different from the combined effect of 15 and 30 minutes of puppy therapy. So if we lump all the puppy therapy people together in a single group, they should differ from the control. And our second hypothesis might be that those receiving a higher dose of puppy therapy will be happier than those receiving a lower dose. So notice in the first contrast, we're sort of taking the control group and comparing it against any kind of puppy therapy. And then the second hypothesis, we're then you know, uh, testing whether the two types of puppy therapy or the durations of puppy therapy had an effect. So this is kind of the process you'll go through. So what we're doing here, we're taking our model sum of squares and we're partitioning it into different contrasts, which is really a similar idea to the dummy coding. So our first contrast, we're comparing any contact with puppies against no puppies. And then in our second contrast, we're breaking apart where we lump together the 15 and 30 minutes of puppy therapy. We're breaking that apart uh, to compare those two groups. So contrast one tells us does having puppy therapy of any sort have an effect relative to not? And the second contrast tells us, does the dose of puppy therapy matter? Let's have a look at some other experimental designs, really more than anything, just to ram home that there isn't like a set, a set rule that you can apply all the time. So imagine you had an experiment with four groups. Three of them are experimental groups. I've labeled them imaginatively, E1, E2, and E3. And we've got one control group, which of course C1. The limits of my imagination are kind of boundless with uh, how I label these groups. So we might, this, there'd be situations where this doesn't make any sense at all, but we might, for example, say, in our first contrast, we'll compare all the experimental groups to, all the, to uh, the control group. So does whatever we did to the experimental groups generally have an effect compared to not doing that thing? We're going to have to assume here that our three experimental groups you know, had a broadly similar kind of manipulation. But then we've got this group of experimental groups, E1, E2, and E3. They've all been lumped together. So we need to kind of slice up that bit of cake and see what we find. So it might make sense to say lump E1 and E2 together and compare them to E3. Might not. There might be a situation where that doesn't make any sense at all, but that's one possibility. So now, in contrast to E1 and E2 are kind of lumped together in a chunk of cake. So we'd want to slice them up too as well. Important thing to note here, so we get third contrast that compares E1 and E2. So we started off with four groups, we ended up with three contrasts. Also note, the control group gets used in contrast one, it never gets used again. It's not in contrast two, it's not in contrast three. Notice E3, it gets singled out in contrast two, and then never gets used again. And this is this maintains the independence of the contrast. So once the control group's variation has been sort of eaten up, it can't be used again. It doesn't get regurgitated and brought into another contrast. 
So now imagine a scenario where we've got two experimental groups, E1 and E2, and two control groups, C1 and C2. It might make sense, but not necessarily, that our first contrast compares experimental with controls. So we lump the two experimental groups together, the two control groups together. And um, you know, like I said, there'd be situations, depending on what you're doing, where this wouldn't be a sensible thing to do at all. But let's imagine it is. Um, so now, in this first contrast, we've got two experimental groups lumped together. We'd need to break them apart at some point. We've got two control groups lumped together. We'd need to break them apart at some point. We can start that process in contrast two by breaking apart our experimental chunk into a comparison of E1 and E2, and our control groups don't feature at all here. But we do have to bring our control groups back in a third contrast to separate them out. So we would compare C1 and C2. Again, you can see at, at no point does any um, group get singled out and then reused. So in contrast to E1 and E2 are singled out and they don't get used again. And in contrast three, C1 and C2 are singled out and they weren't used before as like individual groups. They were only ever used when they were lumped together. Now, once you've sorted out which comparisons you want to do, that is only half of the battle. The second half of the battle is you then have to come up with numeric codes, numbers, that represent the contrast that you've devised. So it's, like it's bad enough, or it's hard enough coming up with a contrast, but once you have, you then got to come up with some numbers to represent those contrasts. Um, so basically, um, I've come up with some rules to help you with this, and they're just, they're, you know, they're kind of guides, they're not like, they're not actual rules, it's just if you like follow this process, you should uh, kind of end up with some sensible codes, hopefully. So, um, you know, settle down, get yourself a gin and tonic or something, and we'll have a look at them. So rule number one, when we're thinking about weights or numbers that we can assign to the groups, uh, you can think about positives and negatives. So basically all this stuff gets put into an equation, right? And positive's the opposite of negative. So if you assign groups positive weights and assign different groups negative weights, those groups end up getting compared to each other. So rule number one, once you've decided which groups you're comparing, you just randomly decide to assign positive numbers to one chunk and negative numbers to the other chunk. And that will basically make sure that, that those two chunks are compared. That's rule one. Uh, rule two, two, you need your weights to sum to zero. Otherwise the maths goes haywire, basically. If a group is not involved in a comparison, assign it a weight of zero, because if you multiply something by zero, it becomes zero. So that will just wipe it out of the contrast. So if a group's not involved, it just gets a zero off the bat. And rule four, this is where this story gets a bit complicated. Rule four, um, for, a, a, for a given contrast, we start off setting an initial weight. So the initial weight assigned to the group in one of the chunks should be equal to the number of groups that are in the opposite chunk. We'll look at an example of this in a minute, but that's an initial weight. That's not your final weight. That's just like a stepping stone to the final weight. So first off, initial weight, okay, everything in this chunk, we just look at how many groups there are in the opposite chunk, and that's gonna be our initial weight. Then to get the final weight, we divide the initial weight by the number of groups that had non-zero weights. So the number of groups that are actually involved in the contrast. So <laughs> let's have a look at how this plays out with our puppy therapy example. So our first contrast for puppy therapy, we uh, chunked together the 15 and the 30 minute group into a single uh, kind of entity, and we compared it to the no puppy control. So first off, sign of the weight. Well, like I said, we assign one chunk a positive weight, the other chunk a negative. Do it whatever way around you want, it's not gonna make any difference. I've just decided to go positive weights for chunk one, negative weights for chunk two. The magnitude of the chunk, well, this relates to the initial weight. So we give a magnitude 
that is equal to the number of groups in the opposite chunk. So the magnitude for chunk one, for the 15 and 30 minute group, we want that to be equal to the number of groups in chunk two. So chunk two only had one group in it, the no puppies group. So the magnitude for the first chunk is gonna be one. For chunk two, the no puppy control, we look to chunk one, we look at the opposite chunk. So how many groups are in that? And in, in that chunk, there's the 15 minute and the 30 minute group. So there's two groups involved in that chunk. So the opposite chunk has two groups in it. So we give it a, we give the weight a magnitude of two. So <clears throat> our initial weights, we combine the sign with the magnitude. Our 15 minute group will get a plus one. Our 30 minute group will also get a plus one. And our no puppy group will get a minus two. That's the initial weight. Now we ask how many groups have non-zero weights? Well, all three of them do. So how many groups are involved in this contrast? All three of them. So our final weight, we divide by three. So our final weight will be a weight of one third for 15 minutes, one third for 30 minutes, minus two thirds for the no puppy control. And if you add these up, you get a third plus a third minus two thirds gives you zero which covers uh, one of the other rules. Okay, that's all well and good. Let's move on to contrast two. And contrast two, the no puppy group is not involved. So we're just comparing the 30 minute group to the 15 minute group. So what's the sign of the weight? Again, I'm just arbitrarily assigning positive to chunk one, negative to chunk two. What's the magnitude? Well, for both chunks here, the opposite chunk contains one group. Both of the chunks contain one group, so the opposite of each chunk is one. So both of these chunks get assigned a magnitude of one, and we know that to get rid of the no puppy group, we assign a magnitude of zero. So the initial weight for the 30 minute group is gonna be a plus one. For the 15 minute group in chunk two, it's gonna be a minus one, and for the no puppy group, it's gonna be a zero. That's the initial weight. To get the final weight, we need to divide by the number of groups that have non-zero weights, or the number of groups involved in the contrast. So here, the groups involved in the contrast are the 30 minute and 15 minute group. So they're the ones that have non-zero weights. So we need to divide the initial weight by two. So that means the 30 minute group will assign plus a half, and the 15 minute group will assign minus a half. Now, that's all quite tricky. What does this coding do? Why are we coming up with these values? Well, let's just go back for a second to our dummy coding. And we saw that when we use dummy coding, we end up with two dummy variables that contain zeros and ones. By using contrast coding, we still have two dummy variables, but now they don't involve zeros and ones, they involve the values that we've just come up with. So if you are a participant in the no puppy condition, then the value that you have for contrast one, the puppies versus no puppies, is minus two thirds. And the value that you have for the second dummy variable, the contrast two dummy variable, is a zero. If you were in the 15 minute puppy group, you'll get a score of a third for contrast one and minus a half on contrast two. And if you're in the 30 minute group, you get a value of a third for the first contrast and a half for the second contrast. And just like with dummy coding, these two dummy variables, these contrast dummy variables, get entered into the model as predictors. So it's the same process as before, it's just we've used a different coding scheme. And by using a different coding scheme, our betas will represent different things. So in the, the dummy model, we saw that we predict happiness from uh, two dummy variables, a long, uh, you know, which is like a 30 minute versus control and a short, which represents the 15 minute versus control. And they had betas attached to them. And those betas represented the differences between the group means of say the 30 minute and the control and the 15 minute and the control. With the contrast model, 
it's base it's kind of the same except now we could call our dummy variables contrast one and contrast two instead of long and short they still have betas attached to them but now those betas are going to represent different things so for contrast one the beta is going to represent any form of therapy versus the control and for beta two the con so the beta for the contrast two that beta is going to represent the difference in the means between the 15 and 30 minute group so let's just recap the dummy model from earlier on. So in the dummy model, when we use dummy or indicator coding, we're predicting happiness from group membership. And we end up with uh, betas that represent the difference between the mean of the 30 minute group and the control group and the mean of the 15 minute group and the control group. That's what the dummy model is. So the kind of default model, if you put in a categorical predictor. And this is the contrast model. So what do the betas represent in the contrast model? First of all, our first contrast compared any form of therapy to no puppies. So here we have to imagine that the 15 and 30 minute group have literally been lumped together. So just have a look at that change again. So we imagine now instead of the 15 and 30 minute groups being separate, they're now the same group with one mean for all those people. So again, just for, just to ram this over the third time, have a look. This is the uh, the dummy model. So we've got two group means for the you know represent 15, 30 minutes, but in the contrast model, that switches. So we're just lumping all those people together to be a single entity, and the mean of the 15 and 30 minute group lumped together is 4.1. So the beta attached to contrast one is representing the difference between the mean of anyone that had therapy so all those participants lumped together against uh, anyone who had no puppies who was in the control so it's going to be the difference between 4.1 and 2.2 which will be 1.9 for contrast 2 when the no puppy group's not in there at all so again if you just look at this look at this switching the no puppy group is blanked out it's not involved in this at all so the beta for contrast two is representing this difference here, the difference between the 30 minute group and the 15 minute group. So that's the difference between five and 3.2, which is 1.8. So when we fit this model, and the overall F is gonna be unaffected by this, because all we're doing here, we're not doing anything that influences the overall F, what we're doing is partitioning uh, the variance basically associated with that predictor into sort of subcomponents but we're partitioning it in a different way to when we use dummy or indicator coding so what's changed first of all our intercept now represents the overall mean of all participants Then we have contrast one, which I've labeled as puppy versus none. So that's having some kind of puppy therapy versus having no puppy therapy. Well, as we just calculated, that gives us a beta of 1.9. So that's the difference between the mean, of, uh, the mean happiness in the control group compared to the mean happiness of anyone that had puppy therapy. That has a T statistic that is significant, just about, it's just below 0.05 and you can see the confidence interval there if we were to assume that this was one of the samples where the confidence interval, one of the 95% of samples where the confidence interval contains the population value, we're saying that that mean difference between puppy therapy and, and no puppy therapy would be somewhere between 0.23 and 3.57. Now, for looking at the difference between 15 and 30 minutes of puppy therapy, again, we calculated this difference, it's 1.8, that's the difference between the means of the 15 and 30 minute group. That's a T statistic of about two, and that is just about non-significant, but you know, only just. And you know, frankly, probably we could just interpret the B. So the difference in uh, group means for 15 and 30 minutes of therapy is 1.8 on that 10 point scale, which is a reasonable difference, I would say. I'll be honest, I'm still not loving this lecture. I think maybe we need more than photos. 
I think we need a video of when I discovered snow. I remember that day. It was so fun. All the snow was white and kind of cold. Yeah, that was a great day. Who doesn't love snow? And puppies. Okay, so that's contrast coding. There are some other ways to look at differences between group means. And one of those ways, which is, it's, it's a, in a way, I think a little bit antithetical to the ethos of the linear model, but there are times when you might want to do it. You might want to compare all means against all other means. So all pairs of means to see where a difference is lying. Now, these are called post hoc tests because Normally, you would only want to do this if you didn't have any a priori hypotheses. So if you were just, you know, you measured group membership and you weren't really predicting which groups would differ from which, so you just like throw it all in the blender and see what comes out. It's not a great way to do science, but, you know, there is, I guess, a time and a place for this kind of exploratory analysis. So the idea is, is you just compare every group mean against every other group mean for your categorical predictor. The problem in doing this is it inflates the type 1 error rate, but this is also true of uh, dummy coding. You will inflate the type 1 error rate. Uh, the degree to which it's inflated, you can calculate. It's known as the family-wise error, and assuming you're using the standard 0.05 level of significance, your family-wise error is 1 minus 0.95 to the power of n. So in our case, where we've got three groups, <clears throat> our n would be 3, so our family-wise error would be 1 minus 0.95 to the power of 3. So the way to combat that is to adjust the alpha, or sometimes it's the test statistic that gets adjusted, to be more conservative. A very, uh, yeah, relatively straightforward method, at least conceptually, is there's something called the Bonferroni alpha, where if your alpha is 0.05, you'll just divide that 0.05 by the number of tests that you've done. That's a simple way to think of a Bonferroni correction. So, uh, you know, with 10 tests, your 0.05 would go down to 0.005. So basically, you, by do, you do lots of tests, but you do each of those tests using a more conservative level of significance. So here's an example of doing Bonferroni tests, Bonferroni uh, post hoc tests on um, our puppy groups. So first thing to note, we've got three comparisons here, 15 versus 30 minutes. No puppies versus 15 minutes, no puppies versus 30 minutes. We've got the differences between the group means for each of those comparisons, a T statistic, and an associated P value, which will have been adjusted for the number of tests that we're doing. Uh, and you can see from this that the only uh, comparison that goes below the 0.05 threshold for significance is that difference between no puppies and the 30 minute therapy group. The other two are non-significant differences. So, you know, this would, if, if significance testing is your thing, this would tell you that the only significant difference between groups was between the control and the 30 minute group. We could also interpret those raw differences in a meaningful way, which we, we kind of have done because they're the same as the betas in various models that we've looked at before. Another thing you can do, which does make sense in this example, is uh, we, we said we might hypothesize a dose response, right? So that the means go up as a function of how much puppy contact you have. So uh, we could look at this using something called trend analysis or a polynomial contrast. and. Uh, on the, the screen is a diagram illustrating some um, different kinds of trends across categories. So this only makes sense when your categories are ordered in some way. So in our case, they are ordered. We've got no puppies, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. So there's a, a kind of an order to the groups. If there isn't a natural order to the groups, you shouldn't be doing trend analysis. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so first of all, you can look for a linear trend. So you can just say the means go up or go down as uh, you know across the ordered categories so this is shown here that's a linear trend but it doesn't have to be going upwards it would be you, know, you could also look for a downward linear trend so as you move across the categories happiness was going down 
So, for example, um, if you were predicting your current happiness based on how much of this lecture you had watched, um, or well, we'd have to divide people into groups, wouldn't we? So, you know, you've got different groups who have to watch different amounts of this lecture. Um, you know, you would find that as the as the amount you watch increases, um, your mean happiness should go down. For example. Anyway, uh, a quadratic trend is shown over here and this would be where there's sort of it's basically a non-linear trend so there's some kind of curvature to the trend so on the diagram it's showing a situation where as group membership increases across the ordered categories the um, outcome variable kind of goes up or the, the means go up but then start to go down again but again this could move in the opposite direction you could have something where the means go down and then start to go up and that would also be a quadratic trend you've got a, a cubic trend this is where there's kind of two changes in direction so what's shown on the diagram is the means start going up then they go down then they go up again and I mean hopefully it should be obvious that as, as we're increasing the complexity of the trend we need more and more groups to demonstrate that so you you to show a cubic trend you need at least four groups um, and you know to as you move up you need you know even more groups than that realistically i'm not sure anyone um it's difficult to imagine hypothesizing a cubic trend but just so you know what they are even more impossible to imagine uh, a quartic trend so this is where you've got three shifts in direction so what's shown on this diagram is the the means kind of go down then up and down then up again again you, you need at least five means to show this kind of trend and i'm not sure I can't think of an obvious situation where you where you would predict that kind of complexity and means changing across ordered categories. So typically, looking for a linear and quadratic trend is kind of, I guess, the the most that you'd be likely to predict in the real world. So someone's now going to write in and tell me how wrong I am, which is fine. Uh, so here, for example, when we run this analysis on our uh, puppy data, uh, this represents the effect of a linear trend and the one with the dot Q is the effect of the uh, quadratic trend. So again we get a beta associated with each trend and a T statistic and a significance value. So it looks like the linear trend is significant so happiness is increasing or mean happiness is increasing linearly across the three groups. Uh, quadratic trend is not significant so you know a, a straight line pattern of means sort of best best fits a, a quadratic trend does not um, kind of describe the change in the means uh, particularly well okay so just to summarize all of that um, this is the second lecture looking at categorical predictors and we've seen in this lecture how you can code categorical predictors to test specific a priori hypotheses, so hypotheses before you collect the data. So you design your study in a way where there is a logical set of contrasts to conduct. You want your contrast to be independent. You should end up with one fewer contrast than the number of groups that you have. And you want each contrast to only compare two chunks at a time, but those chunks can be made up of multiple groups. You assign weights to each group within each contrast you assign one chunk positive values, the other negatives. You assign initial weight, weight equal to the number of conditions in, or number of groups in the opposite chunk. And then you divide that initial weight by the number of groups with non-zero weights to get your final weight. An alternative is post hoc tests where you just compare all groups against all other groups but adjust for the fact you've done multiple tests. You can also, if you use dummy coding, it's a good idea to adjust for the fact you've done multiple tests as well. And if your groups uh, have some kind of meaningful order to them then you can also uh, test for something called a polynomial contrast or a trend where you look for example a linear change in the means or uh, a quadratic change in the means okay until next time see you later bye